Good afternoon. We're going to start to, this afternoon with, with some panels, and we'll wind up with the Director of National Intelligence. But before we do that, um, this is the best part of the day for me. A year ago, there were about uh, 70 people got together and started working on a project called Let's Define Homeland Security Intelligence Enterprise. Well, that was whittled down to 40 people when we got into that four-letter word called work. Now, these 40 Americans, 40-some Americans, I characterize as great patriots. These are people from academia, the public sector and private sector, who had day jobs, but at night, on weekends and holidays, met to discuss the issues, to frame the issues, to listen to people talk to us, presenters. They wrote, they would take it to the, they take their papers to the advisory boards, the governance board and the special advisors, and get critiqued and go back and write again and write again and again. To present today what you have as the paper outside on the table. In addition to this paper, the Intelligence Protect the Homeland, there are three additional papers that will be posted online in the short term and a fourth later on. So I think it's only appropriate now that we recognize those great patriots who, in the true American spirit, were not satisfied with the, with the status quo, but took on the tough challenge to define what we have known to be, but never recognized, the Homeland Security Intelligence Enterprise. I'd like to start off by recognizing my two co-chairs, co the vice chairs. Dr. Kathleen Kiernan and Dr. Laura Manning Johnson. Please come out on the stage. We also had a dedicated intern. She doesn't expect to come out on the stage, but I want her to come out here. Miss Amanda. I'm going to recognize, I want you to hold your applause, I'm going to recognize the four, uh, there's five, two co-chairs for one committee and three other uh, chairs for, for the subcommittees, I mean. First, subcommittee one, the definition, Rob Regal and Neil Shalom. Please stand up if you're here. I know Rob was here earlier, but might have left. The second subcommittee, which is Development and Integration of the Homeland Security Intelligence Enterprise and Public Engagement, Mike Rollins. The third subcommittee, Full Integration of Enterprise and Ecosystem, Michelle Farr. And the fourth subcommittee, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Mission, Dan, Dan Prieto. Now, with that, would all, stand up, keep standing, Dan. Will all remain, all the other members of the Homeland Security uh, Council for, Intel, uh, Homeland Security Intelligence Council, please stand up. The Governance Board and Special Advisors and all the INSA members who helped us out, please stand up and please give them a round of applause. These are true American patriots. I turn it over to Kathleen. It's always both humbling and rewarding to follow a guy like Joe Rosick. Colonel Rosick epitomizes, in my mind, everything that we should, we should strive to be as leaders, quietly competent and sincerely a genuine American hero. It was absolutely a pleasure to work with and, and serve Joe. I have the pleasure now of introducing just a dynamite panel. And let me start with Matt Olson, newly uh, appointed director of the National Counterterrorism Center and had the opportunity as the newly appointed director of the National Counterterrorism Center to brief the president yesterday, which was pretty exciting, I, I understand. He's former general counsel of the National Security Agency, former official at the Department of Justice, a graduate of Harvard Law School, and a professor of law at Georgetown University. Next to Matt is Chief Kathy Lanier of the Washington Metropolitan Police Department. Kathy earned her bones in the street beginning in 1990. She was part of and led all aspects of the uniform patrol and tactical operations of the police department. Kathy also represents the very best America has to offer in the law enforcement world. She, co she holds dual, dual masters from Johns Hopkins University and the Naval Postgraduate School. Next is John Pistol, 
currently the administrator of the TSA, following a tremendous career in federal law enforcement with the FBI, earning the rank, and earning is, is much more important than being appointed, earning the rank of deputy director. Under his watch, TSA continues to grow as a risk-based, intelligence-driven, counterterrorism agency dedicated to protecting our transportation systems. John also has a law degree from Indiana University School of Law. Next is Suzanne Spaulding. She is recognized around the world as an authority on national and homeland security issues, including cyber, critical infrastructure, CBRN weapons. She served as the minority staff director of the HIPSI and also as the general counsel for the SISI. She was the assistant uh, general counsel for the CIA prior to that, and she currently works in the field as a practicing attorney. You, th this panel will be led today by Jean Mazura. And when I was thinking through her career, I had to draw a parallel to law enforcement. Investigative journalists have a kindred spirit with law enforcement officers. They see the world through untinted glasses. They speak the unfarnished truth and seek always to examine the most complex of issues. Please welcome a highly acclaimed anchor and reporter and a woman used to driving world change in a marvelous panel. Thank you. Kathleen, thank you. Thank you all. So Scott McNeely of Sun, uh, of Sun Microsystems said a few years ago, you have zero privacy, get over it. Now, I don't think even the most zealous civil liberties advocates really think we have zero privacy, but certainly they have concerns that civil liberties and privacies have eroded since 9-11 with the Patriot Act and more. Today, hopefully, we're going to get a fix on where we are, where we might be able to improve where things should change. So first, I'd like to ask uh, each of our panelists to set the stage uh, from where they sit. Uh, Mr. Olson, this is your first appearance of this kind since becoming head of the NCTC. So let me let you do the honors here with your remarks first. All right, thank you very much, Jean. Uh, and, and thank you uh, to uh, INSA for uh, holding this panel. And, uh, and it's really an honor for me to be uh, participating in this with uh, my friends and colleagues, uh, we, we represent a sort of, as I was thinking about, we represent a, uh, uh, a number of perspectives, the federal, state, local, law enforcement, intelligence, and I think it's a very fitting group uh, along with the private sector. Um, so yeah, I've been at uh, NCTC for all of about three weeks. I, I walked into lunch a little bit late just in time to hear General Hayden say NCTC was an unqualified success. So I almost thought I'd just get up and go home. And I'd, my part was done. Um, but I can't take credit for that. Uh, Mike Leiter, my predecessor, uh, Admiral Red uh, before him, and uh, John Brennan, uh, who helped start the whole uh, thing going, uh, deserve the credit for that. Um, but I hope to continue that, that, uh, that record of success. Um, so I'll just say a, a, a couple words about NCTC what our mission is, and, and then a couple of quick thoughts uh, about uh, uh, the, secu the privacy uh, and civil liberties issues uh, that we face. Um, you know, first of all, uh, as, as most of you know, uh, NCTC was created uh, post 9-11. It was a creature uh, that, of, uh, of that tragic day. It grew out of the, the work of the 9-11 Commission and then Congress in 2004 created NCTC. We uh, really help lead the government's efforts to combat international terrorism. We combine uh, people from around uh, the intelligence community and outside the intelligence community in a really healthy uh, and diverse mix of professionals uh, who bring a, a, a varied uh, set of perspectives and backgrounds to look at all the information that we can bring together. And we are singularly focused on that one mission, which is counterterrorism. Um, so very briefly, just a, a couple of our mission sets. One is intelligence ana analyst, uh, analysis. Um, by law, NCTC serves as the primary organization in the U.S. government for analyzing and integrating all intelligence about uh, terrorism and counterterrorism. Uh, we have a unique res responsibility to examine uh, international terrorism issues uh, that span geographic boundaries. We analyze intelligence regardless of where it is collected, uh, whether that's inside or outside the United States, and we have access to essentially the entire catalog of counterterrorism information that the government possesses. Um, our second uh, primary mission area is watch listing. Uh, we serve as the central and shared uh, uh, knowledge bank on known and suspected terrorists. 
um, and we support uh, terrorist watch listing. We maintain the uh, terrorist identities data mart environment, or TIDE, that many of you have heard about. Third, uh, a third mission area or responsibility I'd like to highlight is, uh, and I think it's particularly relevant to this panel, is sharing information with state and local law enforcement. We have a group called the uh, Interagency Threat Assessment and Coordination Group. But in a nutshell, it's a, it's a small group of professional first responders from around the country who come and serve at NCTC, led by DHS and FBI, and their responsibility is to look at all the intelligence that we are producing and seeing and, see, and, and to take that information and turn it into products for first responders. So we have a product called Roll Call, unclassified uh, 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 piece of analysis uh, that is designed uh, specifically for a first responder audience. Um, and that goes to the issue, again, that General Hayden talked about of not just vertical intelligence, but horizontal, uh, I'm sorry, vertical sharing of, of, uh, uh, of intelligence uh, down to the state and local, uh, our state and local partners. The fourth area of responsibility I wanted to highlight is uh, our strategic operational planning. And this is a little bit different than the others in that it's not part of the intelligence community per se, but in this, in this role we are charged with conducting strategic planning for counterterrorism activities. We work closely with the national security staff at the White House to support a wide range of, uh, of plans, both strategic plans and implementation plans. Um, so very briefly, two quick points I wanted to make when I thought about this panel with respect to uh, privacy and civil liberties. Um, the first is that uh, these two goals, national security and, and, and privacy, are not in conflict in, this, in the way that people, I think, often think they are. Uh, from the perspective of NCTC, from my time at NSA, we have to, we must do both of those things. And we can do both of those things. We can achieve greater security without uh, any sacrifice of privacy um, through policies and technology and, and, uh, and practices. Um, and then just finally, um, I would want to share that I do have been very impressed. I am an attorney by background. I've been very impressed so far uh, with NCTC's record of privacy protection in my first few weeks. Okay, Suzanne, why don't you take it next? Just quick thoughts on this issue of privacy and security. Yeah, well, I, I want to pick up uh, on Matt's last point, which is uh, this notion that I think you'll, you'll hear, I suspect, from everybody up here, which is uh, reflected in INSA's report on civil liberties that um, we need to stop thinking of these as mutually exclusive values. And I think one of the ways to do that is to watch, uh, pay attention to the way we talk about it. I think one of the things that, that, that has kept us from really uh, understanding the relationship between these two is our traditional way of talking about balancing national security and civil liberties as if they were mutually exclusive objectives on opposite sides of a scale. And if you just took away from one, you'd add to the other and vice versa. Um, when in fact they are mutually reinforcing. Uh, we all understand that, that security is an essential uh, framework within, within which to protect our civil liberties, but it is equally true that civil liberties really are a great source of our national security. Obviously a source of our strength, but important for national security, and we've heard some specifics about that today. Uh, the secretary this morning talked about 80% of the homegrown uh, or, or plots inside the United States uh, were thwarted by local officials and, and, and citizens. That uh, flow of information up to the feds is based on a sense of trust, that the information will be handled appropriately, that individuals will be dealt with fairly. That system to preserve civil liberties is an essential part of that national security structure. The relationship with communities that are going to detect problems can only be maintained if we preserve civil liberties. And, and I know that this is what the framers had in mind, because this was a group who put together this system to preserve civil liberties and a system of checks and balances, not of fuzzy-headed liberals, but of very hard-nosed, pragmatic individuals who had just fought a war, who knew perilous times were ahead, who were choosing a system they thought would be best guaranteed to preserve this very fragile nation. Chief Lanier, it seems like the perfect place for you to jump in. Well, you know, it's uh, a lot of questions have come up about local law enforcement's integration into this information sharing environment and how um, they will factor in the civil liberties, civil rights, and privacy issues. But the reality is, is that that's integrated into our everyday operations. We deal with um, the most critical balances of civil liberties and privacy and civil rights every day. Think about my average day pre-9-11, 
We deal with um, gang violence, identifying gang members, validating gang members, striking that balance between intelligence gathering, criminal predicate to store information and use information in a criminal prosecution. Um, everything from you know, dealing with large protests that come to this city and uh, doing threat assessments that may be posed because of those uh, large protests, all of those things are uh, deeply rooted in making sure we have good privacy policies, we have good management of those policies, and that there's oversight for those things. The, the critical thing here is that the stakes are much higher. I mean, that's the difference. I think we have a real good understanding of making sure we have that transparency, the community outreach, having the connection to our community, and that they trust the, that law enforcement is a legitimate um, partner in this, in this fight. So what's most important for us now going forward into this information sharing environment post 9-11 is that we don't lose that legitimacy. We have to remain transparent. We have to be part of this fight. I think even more so in the past few years as the internal threat inside of the United States has, has grown. Um, so we take that very seriously. And I think as partners in this um, integration going forward with the information sharing environment, um, we have to really make that our priority. Because when we lose that legitimacy, I mean, think about it. After all, our source of information our best defense is the community. If we alienate those sources, we lose the ability to detect, deter, and prevent. So we, we deal with that every day. That's how we close homicides. That's how we stop gang violence. Um, so we value that relationship. And we just have to make sure that that stays a priority going forward. Administrator Pistol, if anybody's been on the hot seat on this whole issue of privacy and civil liberties, <laughs> it's you. <laughs> So and we've enjoyed watching. <laughs> it's so hot that he's moving there. around. <laughs> so give us your thoughts. Well, obviously, uh, being the head of TSA gives a, a person the opportunity to hear a lot of different opinions <laughs> on the All proper the balance between security and privacy. And obviously, with the creation of TSA in November of 01, two months after 9-11, the, the focus has been and will continue to be on the best possible, most effective security provided in the most efficient way, recognizing that we have to and strive to every time that we encounter a passenger, 1.8 million plus times a day, that we respect the privacy and civil liberties of each of those passengers. Now, the, the challenge is that each person in this room and, and watching has perhaps a slightly different definition of what that proper balance is. So for you, uh, something uh, may be uh, completely appropriate and, and, and necessary for security and for somebody traveling with you, they may say, that's way too far. I don't want to go through one of those machines. I don't want to be patted down. And so how do we give the highest level of confidence to the traveling public on every air flight, every flight, 17,000 17, plus flights a day in the U.S., over 50 million people a month, you know, just Big, big numbers. You think of a business that encounters that many people in customer satisfaction surveys, uh, to, to be in the high 90% is, is significant. So based on things that we deal with, we tr uh, try to ensure that we are doing everything we can. There's two things I would highlight uh, that we are doing, have done, or will be doing that highlight the privacy, civil liberties aspects. One is our conversion of the advanced imaging technology machines to the automatic target recognition, which just gives a generic outline of a person. And uh, the passenger is able to see that right there. Some of you have been through that and, and, and see that. Identifies an anomaly uh, for resolution. Um, I'm pleased to, to announce today the, our, our acquisition of 300 more of those machines. And so those will be deployed uh, airports that you travel through uh, in, the, in the next several months. And so that will increase the number of those machines that give us uh, that best possible security against the non-metallic type device, the bomb that we saw on Christmas Day 09, with the highest level of privacy possible. That's one. The other uh, issue that we're dealing with is part of our risk-based security initiative where we're trying to get away from the one-size-fits-all construct and recognizing that uh, as we can get information from people on a voluntary basis, uh, that we can then perhaps provide a different level of physical screening because we know more from an intelligence perspective. So intelligence is driving what we're doing on the front end so we can uh, do the physical screening perhaps in an expedited way. Again, that's all voluntary. If people want to share information with us, at this, at this first iteration it will be through frequent flyer elite programs. Uh, in certain airports, we'll be rolling that out next month in four airports. And so we have the opportunity to uh, do some things that recognize 
we can provide the uh, best possible security in the most efficient way, recognizing the privacy and civil liberties of all passengers. Let me follow up on the imaging machines, which have been so controversial. I thought you might. Yes. Well, mm. I was hoping you would. We've been through this go. before. <laughs> okay, just show of hands. Have you been through an advanced imaging technology machine? Okay. Okay. I want to see the show of okay. hands if you've refused to go through a body imaging machine. Am I alone? Two of no, us? Okay. okay. Um, my question um, has yes. to do with the fact that you've changed the machines now. You've changed yeah. this software, so you're not showing the anatomical detail. Is that an admission that TSA got it wrong? I think it's a, a recognition that we could do better. So the first, the technology, no, just being very, very frank, that, that uh, the technology that was in place uh, had all the privacy protections for that type of technology that could be in place. So a separate room with an image operator seeing the image, never saw the passenger. The, the security officer who saw the passenger never saw the image. So, and the machines had, did not have the capability to, uh, to store or transmit the images. So uh, as, as, as good of privacy protections could be built in for that technology were in place. This is the next generation, if you will, that gets away from that uh, outline of a, a specific person to that simply of a, a generic outline of a person, which again, in complete transparency, the, the passenger can see right there and they can say, oh yeah, I forgot I left a card in, in my pocket or whatever it may be. I'll let you off the hook for now. Suzanne, I wanted to follow up on something you said about this isn't a zero sum game. Uh, that you can have both privacy and security at the same time. But in the last couple of days, a couple of developments, an appeals court ruled against the Justice Department when it came to tracking individuals with cell phones. And also you had an AP poll that came out showing that a majority of Americans, if they had to choose between security and civil liberties, a small majority would choose not to give up their civil liberties. What I'm wondering is if 10 years after 9-11, we're seeing something of a backlash, uh, something of a, a rethinking of this issue. And does that pose security challenges, it, challenges or is that something we can and should embrace? Uh, well, it's interesting. I, 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 think it is, I think it does reflect that the ground is starting to shift beneath our feet. Um, and, and I will say that it worries me as somebody who spent many years in the intelligence community, uh, both at CIA and then in the oversight, uh, and on various <coughs> commissions uh, for my colleagues in the national security world who are out there running full steam ahead uh, under, a, under a certain um, understanding about what America is asking of them. Uh, and I, I've seen this happen before and they don't quite realize that the ground is starting to shift. Um, and, and when something goes wrong, uh, what the reaction will be back back home, where the level of fear has been reduced, uh, where we are we are hoping to move to a place where we can put terrorism in a in a different kind of perspective. So I think the court's decision um, on geolocation, which was uh, saying you know long term watching every single place someone goes, is different than simply either following them or putting a, a, a tracking device on for a day. It's the difference between a day in the life and the daily life of a person. And I think it has implications for uh, the way the government currently accesses third party records um, and, and the understandings there about rega uh, with regard to privacy interests, where I think a difference in quantity is becoming a difference in kind. Um, Matt Olson, let me ask you, Stuart Baker, former official with the Department of Homeland Security, argues that privacy campaigners have actually undercut security. Do you agree with that? Well, I, I know Stuart. Stuart preceded me at some point as a, a general counsel at, at NSA. Um, no, I, I, I think that uh, along with what Suzanne said, that um, we need to see that, uh, that, that privacy interests are, and, and I think this is the same thing that you said, Chief. Um, you know, the, the, being transparent and, uh, and adhering uh, strictly to the letter and spirit of, of the Constitution and the laws that govern our activities actually builds confidence in what we're doing. It allows the people who provide us information, whether that's mm -hmm. people on the street, um, other agencies, to uh, be confident that that information is going to be handled appropriately. So I actually think that that's a, that, that commitment uh, is a strength uh, and actually it, it has the potential and, and does in fact uh, bolster national security.
I think the, the, the trick and the challenge at times is to, uh, again, I think this is along with, with what you're saying, Suzanne, is to know where the lines are and uh, the, the, the challenge in the intelligence community uh, is, is to, uh, those line, lines are sometimes blurry and the laws change and, and views shift. And what, what I see is what Suzanne identified, that it's very important for operators to have clear rules. And when we have clear rules, we follow those rules. But you're operating in a clandestine environment. So how do you reassure the American public that those rules are in place and those rules are being observed? It's a great question. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, much of what we do is secret by design and needs to be secret. Uh, and uh, so there we, we have uh, institutions and processes in place to ensure that, uh, that those rules are being followed and to give the American people the confidence and trust they, they must have in their uh, intelligence community. And that's typically um, and primarily Congress and the Congressional Oversight Committees. They do that job, and they do that job quite well. Um, but in addition to that, there is, you know, within the executive branch, I can speak to the role that the Department of Justice plays in providing that kind of oversight of the intelligence community. So I think there's actually strong and vigorous oversight, uh, although not the same because, again, a, a, as in other contexts, because of the secret nature of, of much of what happens in the intelligence community. You know, General Hayden set the table for this discussion beautifully and talked a little bit about the um, domestic threat requiring this integration of information from the federal down to the local level. And he said that, that there are boundaries that are part of our DNA. Um, Chief Lanier, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that, about whether it is, in fact, harder, perhaps, to integrate all this information and intelligence uh, from the federal to the local and back up again because of those boundaries. What kind of impediments are there to true information sharing? Well, first, there's, there's two different, I was, I was listening to, to Matt talk, and there's, there's two different types of privacy and civil rights issues that we have to deal with now um, post 9-11 and, and to a certain extent before 9-11. The first is the physical security. That's the, you know, setting up the machine that's going to make everybody go nuts trying to screen people going through the airport. You can do some things to, to lessen that by doing outreach and bringing in a small group of civil libertarians, have them you know, demonstrate the machine up front, get their feedback up front before you launch it. And so you can get input on physical security. Um, after the uh, uh, WTO riots in 1999, we had our first big World Bank mm -hmm. conference here. We went from security fencing that was bike rack to concrete jersey barriers and, you know, but we had to go in uh, and do outreach to the community and we met with, you know, uh, parking lot uh, attendants and, and owners and we got them to agree to security measures. So it went smoothly and we did checkpoints and searches and all that um, that normally would not go over very well, but because we had time to bring the community in and get their input, it, it worked well. With intelligence, it's very different. It's so much harder to go out and get that buy-in. Um, it, it's impossible to go out and get that buy-in from the community, but now my job in the local level is to get that buy-in from the community because I have see something, say something. I've got, I'm launching a major um, iWatch program today uh, when I leave here. So I have to have some way to bring the community in to get that information and assure them that what is pushed up into the federal um, shared space or the intelligence community is something that doesn't infringe upon their rights. So in other words, I'm not an agent for the CIA. <laughs> well, let's talk about the New York Police Department. Which I then. figured you would. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you may know, the Associated Press has recently reported that there was a very close relationship between the CIA and the NYPD and that uh, the CIA is training some NYPD personnel, that there are CIA personnel at NYPD headquarters. Um, and it's raised a lot of questions about the balance between spying and policing. Mm -hmm. um, is this problematic for someone like yourself? You say you want to build a close relationship with a community, but if a police organization has a component that is going into a community and operating covertly, going even into mosques, according to this AP report, does that exactly undermine what you're trying to do? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to stay away from commenting specifically on NYPD, because that's just the smart thing to do. But um, <laughs> I, I will say that, you know, we've always operated on a principle that they're investing, intelligence is a, is a process that is, um, we get tip information or source information, we begin to investigate that. Um, and if we develop a criminal predicate, then the investigation kind of moves on. And, in this case, what we're asking of the community is to report to us behaviors, not profiles, not 
personal identifying information to a, to a certain extent. We're asking them to identify behaviors, report those to us, and if there is no connection to terrorism and there's no connection to a criminal activity, all that personal information is stripped away. It's not stored anywhere. We're not keeping dossiers. We don't have a database. Um, I think that's the right way to go about doing it because the information that you're going to get is going to come from somebody who goes to the mosque. And we've had cases like this where regular uh, participants that go to a religious, whether it be a mosque or a Catholic church or whatever, say, you know, there's, there's a person that's behavior is very suspicious and we think you should look into it. I think then it's perfectly appropriate to determine whether there's a criminal predicate or there's a, ca a terrorism uh, connection, and if so, then to move forward. But there has to be that initial analysis, there has to be that initial vetting, and then pushing that information up, if it's counterterrorism related, pushing that up to our federal partners and, and handling that the right way. That's how you keep people's trust. That's how you keep people reporting suspicious activity. And that's how you do it without violating people's rights. Uh, Suzanne, you're the one non-governmental person up here. Your thoughts on that program as reported by the AP? And its implications. Yeah, well, I, and it, and and um, it's hard to know wh what the facts are here. The, the article I I itself pointed out that that there was some pushback on on their portrayal of the facts. So, um, like Kathy, I'm, I'm you know going to be careful <laughs> about uh, assuming the facts and you know that have been put out there. But I do think uh, you know we we heard this morning um, how important it is uh, to have that seamless relationship. Clearly, some of the training, it seems to me, is not inappropriate. The thing that raised, uh, you know, real red flags in my mind was the assertion that there was somebody still on the CIA payroll who was sitting in Dave Cohen's office as his deputy. I think that's, uh, you know, clearly very troubling uh, in light of the restrictions that we appropriately put on CIA with regard to intelligence collection in this country. Um, and, and, and the assertion that they were, that the, that the other thing that I thought was very troubling was that the city council was not aware of, of a lot of the activities that, that are going on in NYPD. I do think that the issue of local oversight, uh, I think it's raised particularly by the JTTFs, um, but apparently it's also raised by some of the activities of NYPD, making sure that you've got that local oversight by the mayor, by the sheriff, by the city council is, um, is critically important. Um, let me segue to a little discussion of fusion centers, which uh, have proliferated around the country. Um, and uh, they're engaged in some of this gathering and collating uh, and distribution of information. Um, DHS is now tied privacy policies to funding uh, in an effort to, to uh, to address this very issue that we're discussing today. But is there inconsistency amongst the fusion centers? Matt Olson, maybe you can tackle that. I'm, I'm tempted to hand it over to my colleague here from mm. DHS. <laughs> if, um, uh, so I really don't, you know, I really don't have a lot of experience. Right, um, on the job. Yeah, I really don't have a lot of experience you. with, yeah. with, with, uh, with the fusion centers. I, I can speak to it some, if, 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 and because I've been engaged in the, from the beginning, from 2001, in the development of what later became the fusion centers. And, and I think uh, it was a very good move to ensure that um, fusion centers do have um, privacy policy across the board. And there is pretty consistent guidelines in the Code of Federal Regulations for what your privacy policies and, and what guidelines you should operate in. Um, are there still gaps in that? And should there be uh, one single um, kind of consistent privacy policy across all fusion centers? Yeah, probably so. Um, there's been some mistakes made by fusion centers. I mean, yes. I, I, I run a fusion center, you know, in, in Washington, D.C., and, and I can tell you that the evolution that's gone through for fusion centers, you know, in the, in the last six or seven years, they've come a really, really long way, and there, there has been some mistakes, and there will be mistakes. But I think, you know, you're, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. You and better be damned for doing in this world. And <laughs> the kind of mistakes you're talking about? I'm sorry? And the kind of mistakes you're talking um, about? The, the ones that I've seen have been... Um, information that was passed on from one agency to another, third party uh, information that wasn't approved to, to be shared or probably wasn't appropriately shared with personal, personal identifying information. Um, some information I've seen with regard to protest activity uh, and political affiliations, you know, those are evolutions that local law enforcement, most of the major cities have been through years and years ago, but some of the newer fusion centers coming online that are not in a major metropolitan area and haven't been through that evolution, that's a learning curve for them. 
So I think the consistent privacy policy and the, you know, across the board implementation of the Code of Federal Regulations for the, all those things are going to be important, but we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's going to be mistakes, there's been mistakes, but I think the fusion centers are an important part of this network that we have to form for homeland security going forward. So, um, you know, we just have to be tolerant and put the effort in, as, as in the paper that, that, that was released today, says is we have to put the effort in. If there's a, if there's a training issue, let's address it. If there's a policy issue, let's address it. Um, but let's not throw out something that's eight years in the making that's finally starting to add value. You suggested that there are improvements that can be made. Have you got any specific ideas on how to bring better consistency amongst the centers and make the system work uh, with more attention to privacy and civil liberties? Yeah, I, I, think, the, I think there needs to be um, kind of a single um, effort, a singular effort across the board from the federal agencies because, again, this is... If you're not in a major metropolitan area, you're not in a major city, a lot of those um, privacy issues are not something you deal with every single day. It's a different type of privacy issue. The, the stakes are much higher here. So I think that um, the intelligence community and the, and the federal agencies have to take that on to educate this, these fusion centers and make it consistent across the board. Because where it, it may be well understood in, in a one major city, it may not be well understood in a state agency that has a lot of rural participants in there. So um, I just think that that has to come um, out as a consistent policy, consistent training um, across the board from those who know it, who've been doing it for, for many, many years. Something else for you to worry about. In your exactly. Job. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, you know, NCTC does this on a much grander yeah. scale, of course, co combing through the databases and, and collecting the data. Um, and, and it does give some people the heebie-jeebies to think that there's a big brother, all-seeing eye up there, um, gathering this data from all kinds of sources. Um, is there anything you can say to reassure people that you're staying in the right lane and you're not just conducting a dragnet? Sure. I mean, first of all, the NCTC is uh, not a collector uh, in the same way that other intelligence agencies are collectors of information. You're an integrator. We, we're essentially an integrator. We obtain information from other agencies, uh, other intelligence agencies and, and law enforcement agencies. I mean, really, NCTC was an outgrowth of one of the key insights uh, post 9-11 that we've all touched on, and that is that there there's really shouldn't be this distinction uh, between uh, law enforcement and intelligence. It doesn't really make sense to information. It doesn't really make sense to make that distinction. And it doesn't well, make as much aren't sense. There, aren't there boundaries? Shouldn't there be boundaries somewhat well, between law enforcement and intelligence? Well, when it comes to terrorism, then I think the answer is no. I think it, when it comes to counterterrorism, that information that relates to an act of terrorism in the United States is, is no different from intelligence about that, about that act or about that threat. And we need to be able to put that information together. I mean, that was one of the key, you know, changes to the law post 9-11. That was to take down the wall uh, that existed between uh, intelligence information and law enforcement nation information that prevented FBI agents from talking to each other, one on the national security side, one on the law enforcement side. So we really, I think, at NCTC are, are the sort of embodiment of, of that recognition. Uh, the other aspect is the sort of distinction between foreign and domestic. Certainly there are laws that apply to uh, certain types of collection activities when they occur in the, in the United States versus outside the United States. But when those laws are followed and then we get that information, the key that I think the, what the contribution that CTC makes is the ability to look at all that information in one place, domestic and foreign. Um, but the information we get has been lawfully collected by others. We integrate it and then analyze it and then share it. Civil libertarians have raised the question of redress. If you have information about someone and it's simply not correct, what can they do about it? Well, there's a process for, in particular with respect to watch listing, uh, for redressing if there's a mistake, if someone is uh, wrongly placed on the watch list, and that happens, uh, that is effectively, you know, that's successful hundreds uh, of times a year. Uh, profiling, um, one of those words that comes up a lot when we discuss privacy and civil liberties and Administrator Pistol on that score. I know NCTC doesn't profile. I know the <laughs> Chief doesn't profile. I know Suzanne does not. But does the TSA? The Here's TSA the does not profile. So, yeah, so uh, obviously there's been a lot of well, talk about... the behavior we... detection officer. Okay, sure. Let's talk about it in, in regards to that. Yeah, so the, the question about how can we use intelligence in a, in a more uh, informed fashion to make judgments about each individual looking at the person rather than the prohibited items that that person may carry. Uh, that's one of the ways we want to, to go as an organization and 
trying to be a risk-based intelligence-driven organization. That being said, we have to make sure that we don't profile, that we, that we use information about the person that they either share voluntarily through this known trusted traveler program that, that we're working on with airlines and, and airports who would provide a dedicated lane. That's all voluntary, so if somebody doesn't want to share that information, that's fine. They would go through the normal screening process. Uh, for those other uh, issues, for example, we have a number of behavior detection officers, and you've probably read about what we're doing at Boston Logan Airport. Some of you have been through there, perhaps uh, uh, had a, a brief uh, conversation, engagement with a behavior detection officer, an assessor. The whole purpose is to try to get away from, from the one-size-fits-all, to use what some people describe as an Israeli model, that's a, that's a very broad brush, but to use more information about a person, are they exhibiting any suspicious activity? Any uh, cop, any law enforcement officer can tell you in, in just a few seconds, really, of talking to somebody, is there something up about that person? So the whole idea is to take that information and use it in an informed way and to, if, if feasible, to expedite that person's uh, screening or uh, do, do we need some follow-up questions? So that's the whole premise behind it. As we um, move forward with that, if uh, we'll, we'll see, do we need to recalibrate? Do we need to make sure? You know, I got to jump in on the profile jump. thing for just a second because you know profiling became a dirty word because of issues in local law enforcement. So I, I but I have to say that it's not necessarily a negative thing if profiling is looked at appropriately and done the right way. The drug courier profile on uh, mass transit for many, many years was very successful. You know, person pays cash for a one-way ticket, no luggage. Um, it just it identifies something that is an anomaly that was consistent with drug courier profiles. It didn't make reference to race or, you know, any of the things that are associated with negative profiling. So I think, you again, you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater here. There are some positive ways to profile behaviors, to profile other things other than physical characteristics that can help you decide if there's a more intensive look that needs to be taken. So I think just the whole concept of profiling all being negative is a bad way to look at it. Um, we're getting some great questions in from the audience. There are cards. If you've got questions, send them in. I'm going to start using some of these because they're good. Um, Chief Linear, one of these is a follow-up to something you said about discarding information if you don't find a, a link, uh, you don't find anything detrimental. Um, this questioner asks, don't you run the risk of later finding it was one of several warning indica indicators? In other words, could there be a case where several early indicators might really prove to be valid later? Should we retain the data? Mm -hmm. Should it be shared? Well, the rules are, the, the rules are, are, are pretty complicated, but uh, the, if you're retaining anything, it has to be separated. It has to be kept separately. It's not accessed. It's not shared. I think um, it, it all depends on what the, if it's suspicious activity reporting, behavior uh, information, we do this all the time now, and this is a, a current battle that I'm facing with hate crimes reporting. Um, tracking hate incidents versus hate crimes, um, there's a real demand for me to document incidents where uh, people are, um, say, verbally harassed with hate speech. Hate speech is not a crime. I mean, look at Von Brun. The FBI took a beating on Von Brun because he was a known hate monger, but he had never crossed the line to anything criminal. So you, you really don't take any action. So we have to meet that balance again. So my balance is for me to track those incidents without tracking identifying information because no crime has been committed. And then using that as an analytical tool more so than an investigative tool. And that's the, the balance that we have to, to strike. So that information is retained in that sense. Uh, but if we keep anything identifying at all, it is separate from anything else, and it still has to be purged if there's no criminal predicate associated. And, and Gina, I'm sorry, but I, I do think when we talk about data retention, because I've heard this argument for years, um, that you shouldn't throw away any information you ever, you ever got because someday it might be relevant to something. And I, and I think it is a reflection of a, of a larger problem in this whole arena, which is this chasing the myth of risk elimination rather than acknowledging that what we're engaged in is an exercise in risk management. So it's, it's both recognizing that there are national security costs to privacy incursions. So there's some cost there to keeping that data, not to mention the potential risk of a cyber incident and that information becoming public. Um, and recognizing that every little thing that you, you know, that you, that you might want to do um, is, does not mean that you should pursue that. And that in fact, 
uh, when you chase that myth of risk elimination, you're ignoring risks that you're creating by doing that in other places. And retaining everything uh, may, may make you feel you've eliminated the risk that you won't have that information when you need it, but you've created a risk uh, of, of, of public backlash and of exposure. And I'm glad Suzanne mentioned that because that's the whole approach that we in TSA uh, are, are taking in terms of ensuring that we are doing the best possible job to mitigate, to manage risk, but not to eliminate risk. If we, if we truly want to eliminate risk, we would have at least two hour lines in every airport, worldwide global supply chain, cargo would be shut down uh, weeks at a time. So the and whole- And we still wouldn't have eliminated And we still risk. wouldn't have that. So, so the reality is that we are in the risk mitigation, risk management business with the traveling public, with airlines, with everybody in the mass transit area. You mentioned cyber. Let me turn a corner there if I could. The systems in which you store all this information, how safe are they? Every day we read about another incursion into a government database by some <coughs> foreign entity. Well, I, you know, I, I think there's, there's reason to be concerned about the security of all, all this information uh, from a cyber perspective. I don't think you, you can hardly pick up the newspaper and not read about uh, some sort of cyber intrusion, whether at a, at a government agency or, or, a, or a company. So I, I think there's real reason to be concerned, and, and I know that there's lots of effort being put into uh, to ways to try to protect that information. <coughs> uh, and, and if I could just actually go back to a point on the retention, because I just, as I think about retention is an issue, we're, we're, and, a, and it's a balance, as I think we've all uh, tried to make that point, how long you keep this data. But retention is only one part of a broader uh, set of controls that you can place on information in order to protect privacy and civil liberties. And, and, it's, and it's, a, it's sort of a, an end-to-end -end sort of set of procedures and systems. So you control access. You control who can access the information. You make sure they have training. You make sure that um, if they do access, access that information, you can audit it. Then you control how long you retain it, but you also control how you disseminate it, who you can disseminate it to. So retention, I just want to make a point, and I've seen this at NCTC, it's certainly true at other, uh, other places I've worked, NSA in, in particular. Very, very strict controls from beginning to end on how data is handled. Um, security isn't the only challenge posed by cyber. General Hayden said a short time ago uh, that he didn't believe we had any reasonable sense of what privacy really is in cyberspace. How do we grapple with that one? Who wants to jump into that tough one? Suzanne? Well, I do think our, our concept of privacy is evolving. Um, and so it is hard to figure out where those tripwires are. I, I disagree with those who say that, that, that young people today have no sense of privacy. Um, certainly, we've seen there are tripwires, and, uh, and when Google or Yahoo, you know, steps over the line, the, the community rises with one voice and beats them back very effectively. Um, so there, there, there is this sense of wanting to control your information, even if that doesn't mean you're trying to keep it secret. I think it's a growing recognition uh, on some level that keeping secrets in today's world is a losing proposition, but perhaps trying to control what others can do with your information um, is the next stage. And what about the question of surveillance and how much? I was just going to say technology is the next issue. The, the technology that's available now is going to take, you know, 100 years of law enforcement case law back to task, I think, because of just the availability of technology to better um, protect the community. Having the ability to um, quickly locate someone through a cell phone tracking, um, having it, you know, who's committed a, a homicide and, and, and has a victim's cell phone, uh, having the uh, license plate reader system, um, having automated speed enforcement, digital cameras. I mean, there's a whole world of, uh, I think we're going to see, I mean, the cell phone issue is just the first one. There's a whole world of issues that are going to have to be redefined legally because of technology. Well, where in, do you in put a general way, I just think we have to accept the, the, the idea that um, things are changing very fast, and it will always be the case, I believe, that the law is going to lag behind technology and our adversaries. So we, we see that in a number of contexts. The, the adversaries is changing faster than the law, and technology is changing. And so the law is going to tend to lag behind. And law enforcement has asked for some new capabilities. They'd like to be able to tap in to Internet communications. Uh, polling indicates that that's one place where Americans are uncomfortable when we're talking about emails between two American citizens. Who draws the limits? How do we draw the limits? Is that just unlegislatively? Is this something that's going to be a long-out litigation in the courts? 
No, well, the, the law is pretty well settled and, and pretty clear on how to obtain a warrant to listen into someone's conversations or read their emails. On, so on, on, on the law enforcement On telephone communications, but doesn't the technology of the interno internet pose a different, a different scenario? I think the law actually applies pretty well in that, okay. in that setting as well. I will. I mean, well, really, the, I will. the community is who sets the standard. Yeah. I'll tell you that right now. Because um, the, the community will drive what happens with the law. They're the ones that will set the standard. If, if cur what currently is being done is not acceptable to the community, they will fight to have that moderated somehow. And, and, and right now, I think that balance is the community wants us to keep them safe. At the same time, keep their privacy. And that balance is where we end up with the laws that we have now. Um, Suzanne? Well, I, I think that the, the law is pretty clear with regard to uh, real-time communication. Right. Uh, it's a little less clear with regard to stored emails, for example, and it's even less clear with regard to all, all kinds of online activities. And so I think there is some room for going back and, and looking at those laws. And, and, um, and the community can only drive that process to the extent the community is informed. Right. <laughs> and transparency is a real challenge and incredibly important here. Um, one of our audience members asks if potential illegal activities are discovered through social media sites such as Facebook or Twitter, is this an invasion of privacy? Not being a lawyer, I'll punt it to you guys. So John's a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got out of that business about 30 years ago. Oh, okay. so, yeah. Well, it really is very context dependent. It's a hard question to answer, and it, it does depend on uh, on very much that's on. That's why this is yeah, such a hard right, issue. That's, that's a hard issue. So I mean, uh, but some things are public on the internet and can be reviewed uh, with well, very so, little predicate. So what, what, what matters there is, is that for Facebook and, and MySpace and all of those other things, and uh, YouTube for that matter, if it's put into a public domain yeah. without any privacy restrictions or security restrictions set by the yeah. poster. So, in other words, on my Facebook page, if I post something that anybody who goes to my Facebook page can see, uh, it's, it's like on the public street, correct? So if I then have security measures in place so that some of the things I post are just for people that are friends in my network and then the government intrudes beyond that, then you start to cross that line. But I think there's, a, there's an element of what is the expectation of privacy in the social media for what is posted publicly and what is posted behind security measures that we break through. That's, and the, and there's also, challenge. at least there used to be, when I was in the intelligence community, the issue of undisclosed participation. So uh, if you're participating in what is a you know, relatively public uh, conversation, uh, where you don't have to reveal who you are or what your, affin your affinity is, that, that's one thing. Officers. But if you're then pretending to be someone other than somebody from CIA, that presents a different issue. Um, another audience member has posed a question here. They posted, I think, better than I did. It had to do with that quote about, from General Hayden about the uh, reasonable expectation of privacy and what constitutes that on the internet. This audience member asks, what specific challenges does technology and easy government access to so much electronic data pose to American civil liberties, and how should we address it? So, uh, you know, uh, and I'll take, I'll take a little <laughs> bit of a stab at, at it because I, I think it is a big and complex question. But uh, I do think that uh, creating a sense that the government is out there watching and listening um, in a very broad way uh, really does, again, goes back to my point of undermining our national security to the extent that it breaks down a sense of trust, that it chills conversations and activity that is perfectly legitimate, uh, because I think we derive a great deal of our strength from that marketplace of ideas, from, you know, I mean, th there are real national security costs to chilling legitimate activity. So, um, so I think there are some national security consequences to the government's ability through the use of technology to, for each and every one of us, to, to know intimate details of our day-to-day -day lives from moment to moment because of uh, technology and the ability to access records, surveillance, et cetera. And I think we need to think about that. Let's just make sure we're all working from the same framework, though, in terms of, and Matt alluded to it earlier, in terms of for the government, whether it's the FBI on the domestic side in a criminal investigation or through the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court on the, the intelligence, the counterterrorism side, 
Uh, obviously, you have to have probable cause that the, the communicants are talking about something that is violative of, of a federal law, whether it's counterterrorism or criminal, and that probable cause has to be proven to uh, either the district court judge, federal district court judge, or the FISA court judge, and that judge has to approve that. And so there is a rigorous review of that whole process before the government intercepts communications, whether phone, email, whatever it may be. It's those other areas where you're talking about, yeah, what is the expectation of privacy on a Facebook post if it's, if it's something that, that you want just your friends to see or otherwise. So that's, that's where there's questions. Everybody, and there's maybe some in, this, in the audience who uh, monitor, uh, let's say, jihadist websites um, on their own and then may report that to uh, MPD or the FBI or CIA. And so if, if that person's not acting as an agent of the government, then the question becomes, can that be used and, and how so? So there are rigorous protocols and rules in place, so it's not just like the government's out there doing all these things. But we don't have rules, really. We, don't, we, the, the ground, we haven't yet figured out the geolocation, for example, um, a, 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 across the spectrum from the, you know, after an incident all the way through to putting something on somebody's car for a week or two weeks or a month. Um, and, and so I think there are areas where, where, we're, where we haven't yet quite figured out what the, where the lines are. But in some ways, I, I do think that, that, uh, that makes the point that there are some areas that are gray areas that are, that are evolving. In that case, it, it was a D.C. case uh, involving the geolocation. And, and I was a prosecutor in D.C. for many years working with the Metropolitan Police Department. And there was the general view that a, a tracking device on a car over a short period of time didn't require probable cause. Right. Now, you know, so now we're in a new area, and the, and the D.C. Circuit has, has, has issued this opinion. But, but the point I think that John makes is a really important one, and that is that, that this idea of sort of widespread government uh, surveillance outside of uh, the rubric of, of judicial and congressional oversight is not an accurate uh, picture at all. Um, when it comes to surveillance uh, of, of phone conversations involving U.S. persons, that's done with orders given, provided by the FISA court based on a very rigorous uh, review procedure, and, and at the, at the and what must be established is the same standard that's required to, for someone in the Metropolitan Police Department to get a search warrant, and that's probable cause. Um, so it's a very, very rigorous process to get the kind of uh, approval that's needed to conduct the, the sort of surveillance of communications that that question raised. You know, and even in that case, a lot of people don't realize that even in that case, through abundance of caution, the detectives got a warrant. Mm -hmm. It was the timeline uh, that was the issue. They mm -hmm. actually, without, I mean, they went and had a judicial review and got a warrant for the, the tracking. It was the timeline and how long that the, the tracking went was placed and how long it was on there was the issue. So, um, you know, just to clarify that a little bit. Yeah. Um, another question from the audience, and this one I think, Mr. Olson, goes to you. How do we strike the balance between identi identity data requirements to facilitate effective identification of terrorists and being inundated with data? Not exactly a privacy question. Right. I mean, the, the, the issue, one of the things that we're doing, and I, I think this is, we've tried to step this up at NCTC following the, the failed attack of December 25th, 2009 in Detroit, is to really enhance our watch listing information. So the information that we already have on identities, we've really tried to make an effort to go out and find other sources of data to get as accurate a picture as possible of the identities of the known and suspected terrorists that are then placed uh, on watch lists. I mean, the, I think the question might be asking a little bit about how do we deal with the inundation of data. I mean, I yeah. think there, technology can help, uh, you know, better ways to sort through data to make sure that we're separating the wheat from the chaff. I mean, that is, uh, I think there are improvements in analytical tools that give us more, uh, more capabilities in that regard. Let me switch from high tech to low tech for a minute. Chief Lanier, you mentioned see something, say something. This is a campaign that's been embraced and promulgated by the Department of Homeland Security, encouraging citizens, if they see something they think is suspicious, to report it to authorities. Um, civil libertarians uh, feel the hair going up at the back of their neck over that one uh, and are afraid, for instance, that, you know, an angry boyfriend's going to report that you're doing something nefarious to the local authority. But you know that can happen today name. anyway. That, Pardon me? That has always been, the people could always do that. I mean, poison pens or something that have gone on, you know, people writing in stuff to law enforcement about uh, other people in the community has, has always <coughs> happened. Um, and that's not changed by the see something, say something. I think the, and, and part of what we're doing with our launch of iWatch today gets to what Matt was just talking about is that you're talking about a flood of information 
people will report through this tool suspicious behaviors or suspicious activity. Um, we have two ways of analyzing that initially when it comes in. First of all, you've just added 850,000 local law enforcement to the picture when you add the see something, say something campaign. So initial information can come in. Um, it is looked at through an analytical tool, um, Trapwire, and it's also looked at by an, uh, an analyst. And then there's a decision made as to whether this is criminal, counterterrorism, or it's useless. It's, it's, it's bad information, you know, preliminary investigation that it's, it's not uh, either of, of those things. Uh, but it also gives us the ability to push those legitimate suspicious behaviors up into a shared space where we can look around the country through the network of fusion centers if there is an increase in suspicious activity or suspicious packages um, around critical infrastructure. Um, so I think the fear that see something, say something is encouraging neighbors to, to spy on neighbors is something that people could use as a fear long before see something, say something. So, um, and, and I tell you, you know, I implemented several things to fight crime in the city. Um, and, and much to the opposition of many of the prosecutors, you know, anonymous tip lines. I have anonymous tip lines and anonymous text messaging lines. Now, our standards are very high once we get that anonymous information in as to how we vet, verify, and investigate that anonymous information. Um, but as long as you have good policies and good management and good supervision and you do that the right way, um, that's been very, very successful for us. So I, I think that's really going to be the key is making sure that these things are managed the right way and they are focused specifically on behaviors. This is, uh, we're coming up on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, of course, and the 9-11 commissioners recently issued a report card on what they saw as some of the successes and failures of their recommendations. One they talked about was the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, uh, which is dormant. Um, and Lee Hamilton, one of the leaders of the 9-11 Commission, called that a major disappointment. Um, why is it dormant? Does it reflect that privacy and civil liberties just isn't a priority? Suzanne, you want to take a stab at that? No, I think John Brennan addressed that I think they've had a very hard time, uh, you know, filling the chair uh, position. Um, I, you know, it does uh, um, raise a question about whether it's been high enough on the priority list. Has it? Um, uh, you know, I'm not inside, so I don't know where it is on the priority list, but it seems uh, it's, re it's very frustrating and very disappointing that this many years into the administration, they have been unable. Um, to fill those positions. I, I think it's a very important um, role and, a, and an important body, and, and they need to have somebody in there who has real credibility with civil liberties folks. How would it make a difference, and what's happening in the interim? Ideally, what you would have is, is uh, uh, then this, this body of individuals uh, that are there when, the, when these policies and measures are being discussed from the outset. Uh, you know, we've, there's been a lot of talk about this, and it's reflected in the port, not, not tacking these things on at the end, but, but baked in. So they're there. They understand the imperatives uh, on both sides of this issue and, and, and are there to help you formulate your policies. And then they are in a position to be validators for you. And in this area where we have so much secrecy, um, you know, it, it is like the oversight committee. It's important to have credible voices who can come out and say, I'm on the inside. I know all about this. And I'm comfortable that, that we're doing this the right way. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's really important benefit for the administration. And I'm not sure everybody in the administration fully appreciates the degree to which it could be really helpful. And I, I can give a personal example from the agency and departmental level where we have very strong civil liberties privacy oversight as we try to move to more of a risk-based intelligence driven. So how do we use that intelligence? What intelligence can we use? How long do we retain data? Things like that. And Mary Ellen Callahan uh, from the department is here. Margaret Schlanger also uh, in terms of privacy. Um, and we've been through a recent um, initiative with very strong oversight and review and great feedback as to, okay, if you want to do this, here's what you need to do. And we also have a very strong privacy officer within TSA to address those issues. So at least at the department agency level, I see that working very strongly. Is there a need, though, for harmonization well, across the federal government? Oh, I think so, clearly. And that's the, the reason the, the commission made the recommendation to, to get that position filled. I want to take one more audience question here, uh, Matt Olson, this one's for you. How do you ensure that the appropriate federal agency is involved at the local level? Uh, this person raises the reports about the CIA and the NYPD. Are they the appropriate people to be interfacing with the NYPD, or should it be the FBI? Did someone overstep, and who was it? 
Yeah, well, from NCTC's perspective, we, we work uh, with FBI and DHS in our interaction with uh, Chief Lanier and the, the, the state and local uh, agencies. And I mentioned before, we have an organization that helps us write things that then get downgraded and sent out to uh, state and local police officers. I, I would say, so I, I really, from my perspective, it's FBI and, and DHS. And, and going back to something you said, Chief, that, you know, having, having been a prosecutor, you know, the, the level of intelligence that police officers on the street produce every day, both um, from information they're getting from the street, but also from the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. that, the, that the, the, the level of intelligence that's generated out of the criminal justice system is pretty phenomenal. There's almost not a murder that you, uh, uh, in D.C. You couldn't go to the police officer on the beat and say, well, who, who do you think might have been involved? It's a long way to get from that to evidence in a criminal case, but it's very important to realize that what you're doing is intelligence on the street. Mm. Um, Suzanne, when we had a conversation before this panel began, uh, you talked to me about the concept that the American public owns this government. And as the owners of the government, they should know what's happening inside it. I can tell you as a reporter, our efforts to find out what's happening inside the federal government have frequently been thwarted uh, by, we're told that information, for instance, is SSI and can't be released. Is there overclassification? And is that hurting this transparency that we're talking about so much? Uh, I don't think there's any question that there's overclassification. I don't think there's any disagreement about that. There may be some disagreement about the degree, um, but there's no question that we have a system that, that, that classifies by default, and as a result, we have a, 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 you know, overclassification. I think more fundamentally, uh, we have a, 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 a too much uh, classification and not enough transparency that is premised on, again, this illusion that somehow we really can keep this information secret. And, and given the counterintelligence challenge we face today, my worry is that the, we're not keeping it secret from our adversaries, we're only keeping it secret from the American public and from others who could help us and would benefit by getting that information. Clearly one of the big challenges in the necessary cooperation with, at the state and local level and with the private sector is uh, classification. And the answer, to my mind, is not giving out more clearances and bringing more and more people under that classification tent. If Dana Priest is right and we have almost 850,000 people uh, with clearances, that's a lot of people with access to your deepest and darkest secrets potentially. Well, so that's not true though. I mean, there, there are 800,000 people with access to the deepest and darkest secrets. So give the us American the real people. number. <laughs> well, no, it's just, it's just an exaggeration. It's just an exaggeration to put in those terms. I think, But I do think uh, that, that the, the point really is that we need to find ways to get that information, as was said earlier today, to be releasable rather than continue to classify and try to get, and solve the, the sharing problem by giving more and more people clearances. Um, it seems to me that's not the right way. So I'm trying to stay in my TSA lane, but with almost oh, 27 years on. of FBI, I just, Be wild. just get a get discussion. So one of, the, one of the key changes in the FBI post 9-11 is on the information sharing and the whole idea of, of going from a fairly restrictive sharing, not necessarily based on classification, but just on Need to know, need typically, to know. evidence for need criminal prosecution. The um, so the question became then, how can the Bureau change to deal with the new reality of, of the integration? And it really became, and there's people in the room uh, res help partially responsible for that, but share by rule, withhold by exception, on a need to know basis. So as many people as needed to know, that information was pushed out to. But the key became, did they actually need to know? And so as to your SSI point, the, the question becomes, an individual uh, Intel product or an SSI document in and of itself may not reveal any deep, dark secrets. When you compile those in a way that can form a picture, let's say security checkpoint uh, uh, capabilities, uh, detection capabilities, well, we know that bad guys look at uh, the TSA website, for example, look at manufacturers' websites to say what are those detection capabilities and can they go to school on that to come up with a new type of device that defeats those capabilities. So, so yes, that is important, but that need to know is, is still part of that equation. Matt, do you want to weigh in on that? No, I, I just I agree with that. I mean, I, I think that there's a, there's a need to classify a lot of the, inf the information that we're talking about in terms of protecting sources and methods, and it's important to acknowledge the, the role that that classification plays in protecting 
the the ways that we are able to obtain information or or when it goes it, back it, to the last few protected. terrorist attacks think about some of the information you could almost surveil a target and get all the information you need to carry on attack through you know the internet all public information so what is it that you can withhold um, that's reasonable to withhold to you know increase security or make sure you maintain some security I mean, almost every exercise we do, we'll red cell an event or a site, and we red cell it all on the computer. It's all news clippings and public information that you can pull off of public sites. So where do you draw the line on what you can release and how that gets put out there that can be used against you? So, and one of, the, one of the things I think is really important that is part of this whole conversation is the effort to take intelligence information, counterterrorism information, and uh, push it out, DHS and FBI do this, to, at, an, at an unclassified uh, level so that state and local police officers and departments can use that information to have a better idea what to be on the lookout for. And the more you can uh, uh, declassify, unclassify, not classify information and shrink the universe of information that you're really trying to keep secret, the better, off, the better your chance you're going to have of keeping that really sensitive information right. secret. That's right. You said, Suzanne, early on that this isn't a zero-sum game, that you can have both. You can't always have both, though, can you? I mean, we can't sugarcoat this and say, yes, embrace transparency in every instance. And it's not, the point is not that they don't come into tension on occasion. The point is that you have to recognize the national security costs of uh, privacy intrusions, of intrusions on civil liberties, of weakening the system of checks and balances, Which of, are? Of, of failing to have adequate transparency, that, 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 that they are in and of themselves important elements of national security. And so if you, when you have this tension, it's not national security over here and these other things over here. It is how do we uh, manage these risks in a way that maximizes national security and in some cases that's going to be maximizing the protection for civil liberties and privacy uh, because there are national security costs to failing to do that. So it's not just we need to do both and it's nice to try to do both and they never run into, into tension. It's recognize the national security costs of failing to deal with that. What are those costs? Can you be more specific? So again, I think that I think the folks who are on the front line fighting this every day have been very eloquent, particularly Chief Lanier, about the costs of uh, undermining the trust that you absolutely must have uh, with your communities and then between the state and local and the federal level. That I think that's one of the you know very fundamental ways in which that's a national security cost. Someone earlier, Ozzy. Uh, from CSIS made the co comment earlier today about the most important thing that their study concluded was that we need to not fuel uh, the, the terrorist rhetoric, the narrative um, that allows them to recruit, and that is that the U.S. is at war with Islam. Well, that's a, that means there are very real national security costs to the measures we might take that would perpetuate or allow terrorists to, to claim that this is targeting, this is profiling Muslims, that increase a sense of alienation from, from the rest of society, that, that make them feel as though they're unfairly targeted. That's not just a, a, a civil liberty value, though it is in and of itself. It is a national security imperative. Does the polling data that I referred to at the beginning, that people right now are more interested in preserving civil liberties than securing the country, does that indicate that we haven't got it right yet? What do you think? I think it's fascinating, and I, 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 would, I want to read the question. Uh, Senator Warner raised some questions about exactly what, what did that reflect. I, I think it's encouraging. My, sen my sense is having watched these polls over the years, this is the first time that we've seen that number, I think, over 50%. Uh, and, uh, and I actually think it's, I think it's encouraging. And worrisome at all to those of you on the enforcement side? It's, it's not worrisome to me. I, I, you know, I, I think it's, uh, I think Suzanne put it well. I think uh, we need to continue to work at this. And, it, and it's a very dynamic environment and those polling numbers could change. I think we need to also realize that it could change Especially pretty quickly. Especially if something happens. Something happens. Exactly. And, and so I, I think our, it's on, incumbent on us as as leaders in this community to try to give guidance and direction to the people that, that work around us and to, and to be as clear as possible about the rules. Again, my experience has been at Justice, at NSA, and now at NCTC, that the people on the front line want to know what the rules are. They are committed to following the rules. It's just sometimes hard 
in a very uh, dynamic and fast-changing environment to know exactly what the law is on a particular time or day, and so uh, and when what the poll the polls are even more fickle. So I think our our responsibility is to is, is to be leaders and to be, give direction and guidance and and but the the bottom line is people are trying very hard to follow those rules. And that sounds like the perfect place to wrap it up. Thank you very much to Matt Olson, John Pistol, Kathy Lanier, and Suzanne Spaulding, to Incidus CSIS for letting us have this discussion and for all of you for listening and for your input with your questions. Thank you. Thank you.